thank you so much. Um, I have the honor to introduce our speaker. And having been going to uh, the CBST off and on for the past 28 years, I watched it grow from uh, starting off in a very small space in the Westbeth Theater housing um, project um, without where congregants didn't even have a rabbi um, to when the rabbi show, finally showed up and um, she Rabbi Kleinbaum took on the position and with her guidance and vision over the past 20 over 25 years grew the synagogue to the largest LGBTQ and straight congregation in the world um, she steers the helm with grace and strength amid, amidst, amidst numerous challenges including the devastating AIDS crisis uh, where so many members were taken so early to presently an administration that provokes anti-Semitism. When the Westboro Baptist Church came, they took on the synagogue and protested out, outside. Um, she organized a fundraiser where every hour that the congregants stood in front of the screaming crowds, this hate group, they would raise money. So people would donate and uh, to the temple each time and when Westboro yelled a profanity more money was raised and it was illustrated with fundraising charts outside as well so totally standing with dignity and humor in the face of hatred and when Trump passed the ban on Muslim immigrants the activism committee took on as well to this day they meet every Friday afternoon in the in the village in Greenwich Village in front of a mosque and they stand outside holding signs, we support our Muslim brother and sisters, protecting other human beings' rights to practice religion in safety and peace. There have been so many different acts of heroism and activism she displays, even to the point of being arrested last year in Washington, yes? Yeah. Her humor, intelligence, and fierce sense of what is morally correct has moved thousands. The beauty of the atmosphere of CBST is a place for all to feel welcome, orthodox Jews, conservative, reformed, even non-Jews go. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're gay or straight or terminally confused. It is a place for all to come and be worshiped, to worship and be accepted with compassion and grace. Newsweek named her one of the 50 most influential rabbis in America and 150 women who shake the world. She's a force to be reckoned with, and her sermons have touched me deeply throughout the years with an uncanny, uncanny ability to speak directly to me, as if I can walk in when there's thousands, 6,000 people at some of these high holiday services, and I walk in and I sit there weeping because she's talking to me. So I would like to just say, it is, it, I'm getting emotional. I didn't want to get emotional. I, she's touched me so much. She, doesn't, she barely even knows me, but she's touched me so much over these years. And that's the, that's the real gift of her. She, touch, she reaches out and touches so many people. It is a great, it's a great honor and privilege to have you here. Thank you. Rabbi Sharon Feinbaum. Thanks. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. That is really so moving. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have to say, I'm so moved to be here, and it was so wonderful to be here for your meeting. I don't need to tell you that the only thing that is going to save this country will be groups like you working hard on the ground, day to day, fighting for what we believe in, knowing that not one of us in this room might live to see the actual country we want to create, but it's our job every single day to do something about it. So I'm very moved to be here, and this is exactly what we need to be doing. So um, let me say a little bit about CBST. I'll speak for a few minutes, then I understand I'm very happy to take any questions about anything that I either speak about or I don't uh, address. Um, uh, at that time, and you'll handle all that, right? You'll the conversation with the, how people want to handle that. So, as was very beautifully described, I am the senior rabbi of Congregation Beit Simchat Torah in New York City. CBST, as we call it, because nobody can pronounce the whole thing, and it's a very complicated name, was founded in 1973 by a very small group of people. 10 or 15, we're told, were at the original service, but I think 300 people have told me they were all at the original service. <laughs> you know how these things are. But everybody says there were only 10 or 15 people there. Did the radical act of saying they wanted to be both deeply Jewish 
and openly gay at the same time. Let's remember back to what 1973 was like. There was not a single rabbi in the world. There was not a single synagogue in the universe. There was not a single Jewish organization, either the American Jewish Committee, American Jewish Congress, ADL, or the movements of Judaism that had anything to say that updated the Bible from 2,000 years ago, which said it was an abomination and gay people should be put to death. Not a single organization had on record anything more positive than what the Bible says, except for one group, the Sisterhood of the Reform Movement, which is probably the most progressive organization in the national landscape for Jewish organizations, in 1965 passed a resolution, and now this is the most positive thing that any Jewish organization had on record, calling for the decriminalization of homosexuality. That was the most positive, and it was way out there then. The reform movement as a movement didn't embrace that, but the sisterhood organization did. We have to be really honest as Jews to say the Christian religious world, parts of it, were way ahead of the Jews on the issue of accepting gay people. Now we know not all parts of the Christian world, and there are plenty parts of the Christian world which today are some of the most reactionary on this and other issues, but in the mainstream Protestant Christian world, there was movement starting happening in the mid-60s uh, that was not reflected in Judaism. So in 1973, for this small group of Jews to say they didn't want to have to choose between being either gay or Jewish, because up until that point, if you were gay and you knew it, you had to leave your Jewish community if you were going to live as an openly gay person. If you didn't want to lose your Jewish community, and I mean anywhere on the political religious spectrum, you had to either hide the gay piece, and many, many married into heterosexual relationships trying to sublimate or change or live a life in which they could be embraced as Jews. And there are many, many stories, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows these stories as well. So in 1973, it was a radical act to say, no, I don't want to have to choose between being gay or Jewish. Who says that that is a required choice to live? And they did what is so inspiring to me today, because they did what they could do with the resources they had and what was at hand to be able to do. They couldn't change the larger Jewish world by snapping a finger. We all know change takes a lot of hard work. And one of the ways it starts is by people just coming together in a room like this, saying, let's figure it out, but let's start with what we have, the resources we can bring, and the energy we have right now. So those 10 or 15 people had a Friday night service. They weren't creating a big institution. They weren't changing laws. They weren't becoming lobbyists that they couldn't be at the point. They had a Shabbat service, February 9th, 1973. They couldn't do it in a synagogue or in a Jewish space because not a single one in New York City would allow them to do it. But there was an Episcopal church on the far west side of the village, which was known to the gay community because the priest of that Episcopal church had allowed a gay discussion group to meet there since the late 60s. This is also, of course, in those moments, only a few years after Stonewall of 69. And so they went to the priest of that church and said, could we have our Friday night service here? And he said, absolutely. He gave them the children's classroom. And the rest is history in that they brought a shopping bag with a challah and candlesticks and some Manischewitz wine, and they gathered together. And what they did then we now stand on their shoulders. They can't, could not have imagined, and it was a mostly male group, they could not have imagined 1973 that openly gay people could be ordained as rabbis, could teach in Hebrew schools, could be cantors, could be uh, married in a Jewish setting that would be legally recognized, could not imagine that there would be a Hebrew school, which we now have at CBST, could not imagine that CBST would raise millions of dollars ultimately to move into our own space. They couldn't have imagined that we would be a place that straight people would want to join. And I remind myself about this all the time. You have to put one step forward. 
You don't always know the impact you will have way down the road. Most of the people who were there in 1973 died during the AIDS epidemic. We lost 40% of the entire synagogue to AIDS. 40% died. 75% were HIV positive. So in 1973, this group came together. Fast forward to 1981, we, and then we met in a, the church until we moved to West Beth, as was mentioned. And we lived in these very awkward rental spaces, not as beautiful as the Unitarians have. This is gorgeous here. And in 1981, a small notice was published in the New York Times on July 5th of 1981, saying that five gay men in Los Angeles died from a strange and bizarre illness that nobody can diagnose. It was a small paragraph in the New York Times in 19, July 5th, 1981, and that became what we now understand to be AIDS. From 1981, when we knew about a pattern that existed when we didn't even call it AIDS, but we called it GRID then. Some of you might remember gay-related immune disease, and then it became AIDS. Until 1997, when the drugs were uh, uh, discovered that would slow down the disease to make it possible to live with it as a long-term illness rather than a death sentence. So that was from 1981 to 1997. If you were diagnosed with AIDS, you were gonna be dead within six months, often shorter than that. For the gay community, we had no idea it would ever end. Our social lives were surrounded funerals and memorial services and hospital rooms and visiting. And those who weren't dying were taking care of the dying. Those who were sick were always afraid that they had the death sentence. A few people became long-term survivors. Most people died within six months. That was from 1981. We now know it existed for a few years before that, but it wasn't identified. So from 1981 to 1997. It's impossible to overstate the impact that that had in our community and in many LGBT communities. I'll say a few things and then I'm gonna fast forward to the present time. I would say living through the AIDS crisis as a gay community gave us what I think is a lot of wisdom and strength that has given us some wisdom and strength for the time we are in right now. Let me tell you about a few of the things that we as a gay community learned through the AIDS crisis. Number one, there was nobody out there who was gonna save us. You'll remember the government of this United States was completely hostile and silent at best and hostile at worst. Gay people were blamed for being gay and there was no outside white knight on a horse coming to save us. We had to figure out how to create community institutions that would make life possible in the midst of what was a plague, killing the best and the brightest, our friends, killing the people we, we were annoyed by, killing the people we loved, killing the people who were the great community members, killing the people who were the schmucks. You know what? Community's community. So we learned the first thing is it wasn't going to come from on high. If we were going to have any impact, we had to first figure out how we were going to give each other strength to survive this crisis. The second thing is that we had to organize politically because nobody else was going to care about the agenda of the gay community in this moment. The third thing we had to learn is how to ensure that we never lost joy. Those three things are the most important lessons that I think have given CBST a great deal of wisdom in facing the moment we are in right now. So since there were so many deaths in this congregation, I became rabbi at CBST in 1992, in, on August 1st of 1992. My first month as rabbi, I buried four people. I was 33 in 1992, and the people I was burying weren't people of my parents' age, like many rabbis who were doing that number of funerals. You would be do if you were working in a place where you were dealing with older people, that would not be unusual. That's what rabbis do. I was burying my own generation. 
I, as a 33-year-old rabbi, I was burying my own generation. I buried in that first month men who were within 10 years of my age, all of them, and on September 1st of 1992, 30 days after I began, I buried the president of the synagogue. We lost a generation of leadership in, that, in those moments. But CBST made a decision on Friday nights when we would come together for Shabbat services, even though every week was full of memorial services, shiva minyanim, funerals, hospitals, hospital visits, doctor visits, caring for each other, even those who were well were completely engaged in the community around AIDS and HIV. On Friday nights, we created a ritual that before uh, Mourner's Kaddish, we would acknowledge the death of a member, we would offer a special prayer, we would say a few words about that person, but we would not sacrifice the joy of Shabbat. That we would not allow Shabbat full of joy to be completely obliterated by the sadness, the fear, the despair we were feeling. Services, community had to remain joyous, whether we felt like it or not. So fast forward, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2016, I woke up that Wednesday morning, actually, <laughs> that Tuesday night, I never went to sleep until I knew the news. Wednesday morning, I woke up, but as a rabbi, I was inundated with emails and phone calls from congregants about how are we going to survive. That night, that Wednesday night, we had a shiva minion at the synagogue. People could gather. We recited and sang songs and psalms, and people, we had an open mic for people to come up and just speak what was on our hearts and minds. That Friday morning of that week, I woke up thinking, you know, as vulnerable as I feel as a lesbian and as a Jew, as, an, as a rabbi in this new America, how vulnerable must a Muslim American feel today? This man is now, will be president of the United States whose entire candidacy started with an anti-Muslim speech. Remember that first speech when he came down that? The entire first speech he gave launching his candidacy was against Muslims. So I thought to myself, okay, I am feeling pretty scared. How does a Muslim feel today? Fridays, of course, are the day that Muslims have their major communal prayer service called Juma prayers. Happens every Friday afternoon for Muslims around the world. So I called a couple of my uh, interns who work for me at CBST. I called a couple of the other rabbis at CBST. And I said, meet me in front of the mosque I have a relationship with the imam of the mosque at NYU, and let's and I let's go down there and let's make signs and just let's be there to say to them we we're, we're horrified, but please know, Trump does not represent us, and we will be with you. We, the LGBT Jews of New York City, showed up in front of the mosque with the little handmade signs that we made on the subway ride getting there that said Jewish New Yorkers stand with our Muslim neighbors. We got 100 roses from the flower district. But by the way, I learned something really important. You should take the thorns off before you give. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. You could ask them to dethorn the rose, the long stem roses. All right, I had something to learn there. Anyway, so we had 100 beautiful roses. And as we were standing on the street, uh, on Thompson Street in the village, and as we could see people, and you can imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were going to services. They were going to shul that Friday because they wanted to be together with other Muslims. So the crowd was enormous, and as they saw us standing with signs in front, you could see, before they could read the signs, you could see the fear in their faces. And then you could watch as they could read the signs, see us handing out the... the thorny roses, which um, the smiles, they wanted to take selfies with us, they hugged us, they wanted to send pictures to their mother in Pakistan or their sister in, in Ohio to show that there were some Americans standing there. We weren't able to change the big picture right there, but we were able to reach out and do something really practical. 
The imam came to me and said to me, would I speak to his whole community that Friday after, as the services end, just to offer my words to them. So first of all, just, just pause for a minute. Think about what this challenge is in your minds right now, that a Muslim a religious leader asks a lesbian <laughs> rabbi to address his community on this Friday. The love that surrounded me, the gratitude that I received, we didn't talk about politics, we didn't talk about Israel, we didn't talk about LGBT issues. It was profound and transformative for those of us who were there and for the Muslims who were in prayer. I went back to CBST and I said, you know what? On the day of the inauguration, the inauguration happens around noon on the Friday of January, whatever it is every year. We can't watch this on TV, but it's around the time of the Juma prayer. Why don't we bring CBST in a big numbers and instead of listening to this man's vision of a dystopic United States, let's right at that moment stand there creating the America we really believe in. We have power over that. We don't have to be passive. We don't have to say there's nothing we can do. We don't have to geshry, geshry, geshry. All right, we like to geshry. But we can also actually do something. So we had about 75 people from the synagogue meet us in front of the mosque on the Friday before the inauguration, of, not of the, uh, the Friday of the inauguration, uh, and stand there. And the interaction with human beings was intensely profound. And I said to my community, if we could guarantee three people who will show up every Friday on a rotating basis, can we commit to this Muslim community that while we might not be able to do everything, as long as this guy is president, our synagogue will be represented every single Friday? No questions, absolutely. And every Friday for six months, we had our congregation in front of their mosque. People got to be friends. People in the mosque would bring us hot coffee in the wintertime, invite us up once a, fri once a, once a month. They have uh, fried chicken Friday uh, food after the Muslim service. We started sending people in small groups to sit through the service. We started having once a month at services, somebody to come and teach us about Islam, teach us about Muslim prayer, teach us about Muslims and women, teach us about Islam and LGBT. For at the end of six months, I went back to the imam and I said, listen, we're having a great time, but we don't want to wear out our welcome. You know, maybe you're kind of, we could say, it's a, we could, you know, we could retreat with honor and say, we did this for the first six months of this horrific moment in history, but now, you know, we just don't want to wear out our welcome. And he said, please, please don't leave. It has become a deep part of my community's religious experience of Juma prayers to expect to anticipate this kind of gauntlet of love that they walk through before they go into prayer. We are still there every single Friday. Anybody who's in the city on Fridays, we bring the signs. Anybody's welcome to come 12, anytime between 12.45 and 2.30. People just show up, you stand there with a the sign, you'll get hugged and kissed, and there's a range of different people, and let me tell you one other piece of that story. Muslim, young people from the mosque came to us and said, what can we do for you? We wanna be part of, we wanna help your community, we wanna show our, so on, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the young people in their community serve as ushers for our service which was what's mentioned, we have 4,000 people for services. So likely if you come to CBST for services, the prayer book you'll be handed is by a young Muslim from the NYU uh, Islamic Center handing out the, uh, the prayer books. And then Pittsburgh happened. The first people I heard from after the massacre became known on Shabbat afternoon were people from the mosque. By Sunday morning, they had already set up a meetup group. Anybody here know what a meetup group is? You do a thing in a meetup group for Thursday night. What was their meetup group was for? To gather people together to make signs so on Friday night they would come and stand in front of CBST. So many of mu the Muslim community came to stand in front of our synagogue on Friday night, we had to send them to other synagogues. <laughs> 
you know, we're an urban, we're, we have a sm small storefront. It's not like, you know, a big synagogue. We have a, and we couldn't block the sidewalk. So there were so many Muslims, we ended up with the Muslims who came to CBSC covering three synagogues because we could, literally couldn't accommodate all the Muslims who were there. And they came in and joined us for services. And the, their imam came, and he then spoke from inside the synagogue. And here's a piece of what he said. Some people might ask why a cisgendered, straight, Muslim religious leader is here with the gay community of New York, of New York the gay Jewish community of New York City. And he said, well, a lot of people sent us letters saying that they're going to be with us, but you guys show up. Talk about creating bridges and breaking the narratives of hate that the powers that be want us to absorb. And it's getting worse. I don't need to tell you that. And let me just say a couple of other words about this. CBST, I said it, that Shiva Minion right after the 2016 election, we had to now commit ourselves to creating a bold spiritual community of resistance and love. Abraham Joshua Heschel, in 1944, in the middle of the Holocaust and of World War II, he got out in 1939 on a visa from HUC, but he couldn't bring out his sisters and his mother and he was desperate all during the early 40s in the Shoah to get his sisters and mother out, and he was never able to do that. They were, mass they were murdered in Europe. And in 1944, while he knew what was going on in Europe, he wrote a very amazing essay, and he ends the essay with saying, what does God demand of us? As evil as the fascists are, we have to be that degree good. As evil as the fascists are, we have to be that degree good. Wow, that is hard. That is a really high bar of good. But what an amazing framing to give us for how to respond to evil in the world. We have to protest it, we have to demand change, and we have to act as good, as to the degree good as that degree bad is, we have to demand that of ourselves, of our family and our friends and of our communities. And that's what you are doing. Finally, joy is an act of political resistance. Don't be full of despair. Don't be depressed. That hands of victory to the authoritarian uh, monsters in the world. Because despair and depression gives in to inaction. It gives, they want us to be dis, full of despair and depressed. That is a formula for them to have long-term victory. So this is what we learned from AIDS, which I offer all of us today. First, there is no knight in shining armor out there to save us. It's up to us. And everybody in this room demonstrates that by being here. It's up to us. We have to do whatever we can with the resources we have that God has given us to do something good in the world. There's nobody coming to save us. It's us. Secondly, we have to take care of ourselves. And I don't mean in a kumbaya way. I'm not a kumbaya kind of girl. I mean we have to create communities in which people feel supported and loved and energized and and create the communities of resistance and love. Third, we have to always remember that joy is an act of political resistance. You've got to feel joy in your lives. You can't let this crush you. We survived AIDS a lot because the gay community has an intensely insane sense of humor. <laughs> Jews know this. Look at Yiddish literature in Europe in horrible times. American Jews have lost this. American Jews have lost our sense of humor. This is a problem. We gotta stay funny. We have to stay full of joy. We cannot be defeated by the monsters in the world. And lastly, I'll say this. The holiday of Purim is in this season. At one point, Mordechai says to Esther when she doesn't know what to do. You know the story of Purim, Esther, Mordechai? 
And Esther is the word for hidden. She's hidden. She doesn't, and she gets into this role, and she's not sure she wants to shake the boat. Mordechai says to Esther, it is for this moment you are alive. I believe strongly that if we are alive at this moment, there is a reason we have life at this moment, and it's up to us every single day to choose what we do with it. So the reason I came out here is because I am so moved that everybody in this room is reflecting these values. I want to do whatever I can to support you and the work you're doing. I'm inspired by it, and this is what will bring us out of the desert. And someday, maybe not in any of our lifetimes, Moses didn't get to see the promised land. Martin Luther King did not get to come over. And many of us, maybe all of us, but we must be building a future for those who will come after us. And if you don't believe in God, that's fine. I don't believe in a God who cares whether or not anybody believes in God. <laughs> who would believe in such a petty God? But think about it as history. And that's what you're doing here. What do you want history to think of you right now in this moment? How do we want the books to write about those of us who are alive? And I'll end with a famous story from the Talmud. It says, you might have known the story about Choni. He's planting a carob tree, which takes 70 years to bear fruit. And somebody says to him, a young person says to Choni, what are you doing planting a tree that you will never, from which you will never eat the fruit? And Choni said, somebody planted the trees before I was born so that there's fruit for me to eat. My job isn't to think about my generation. My job is to think about what am I doing to create the foundation and fruit for generations to come. So I say thank you to all of you here, and I'm here really to say thank you for the work you're doing, and I'm proud to be in it with you. Thank you. I'll give you one other piece of advice that works for me, so I'm offering you two. If you don't really want to feel happy, you know, because you feel like the world is falling apart, the climate change, you know, all the things you're working on, take a second to think about creating the conditions that make you happy. Like when you feel, what do you need in your lives to feel happy? Don't just say, okay, I'm gonna feel happy. Is it going to an art museum or a theater or spending time with children or mowing the grass or going for a walk in the woods or reading a book about birds? We all know the things and when we're depressed, we tend not to do those things. And Trump is making us all depressed, not to mention, for me, I've been putting on weight since he was elected. I, I call it the Trump effect, you know, the Trump 15. So, but, yeah, don't you? It's like, we are under a lot of stress, people. We're under a lot of stress. So think about the things that make you happy at another time of your life, and just build them into your life. Even if you don't feel happy, just do those things that at another moment actually made you happy. Don't give up on art. Don't give up on music. Don't give up on fun things to do. You will not last. And we need this group of people here to be warriors. And you will not last. So, that, so even on a strategic, if it was only strategic, I would say it's important. But it's not only strategic. OK. And embrace this fetching, too. It's OK. But. America. America. We say that again? So when did Jews lose their sense of humor? This is a whole other lecture I could come back to give. I have a lot to say about this. There's a lot to say. But think about it. The first generation of immigrant Jews were all the comedians in America, right? If you think about that. So it wasn't the first generation. So when you think about it, they became the American comedians. And uh, a lot about it was assimilating into America and fitting in. The children of immigrants who are the great comedians today? It tends to be people who are a little bit outsiders. Jews also used to be great writers and artists. That tends not to be true anymore, unfortunately. Think about the great Jew American writers of the first generation. Who are the great American writers now? They tend to be black women or Caribbean women. Or you need to have a little bit of being on the outside. This is an extremely abbreviated version of a larger, longer. And Jews have wanted to be to American a little too much. And uh, we've lost that element. The gay community is on the verge of losing it too, which I'm very worried about, because it's a little bit of the assimilation thing. 
But just think about that first generation of American Jews. I don't like all of the humor, but they were definitely the comedians. But if you think now who are the great comedians, they tend not to be the Jews. So it's even true on a kind of a bigger scale, when you know, not just, but Jews, and think about how Jews are dealing with the disaster of all the anti-Semitism. I think if we all had a little bit more of a sense of humor about responding to some of the crises we're facing, we'll be able to be more clever. Think about Yiddish jokes and Yiddish literature. You know, the famous Yiddish line that says, you know, a blessing on the czar's head, may he be kept far away from me. That says so much in that little joke that's deep and strengthening. Uh, and there's many more like that. Yiddish literature is full of that. And Jews were extremely weak politically and very vulnerable. But Yiddish literature and, and humor in Eastern Europe was way stronger than it is in America. We take ourselves away too seriously. We're afraid that if we're funny, we're not, be we're not being taken seriously as a minority in America. And I think that's a mistake. Anyway, so this is a huge topic, and I have a lot to say about it, but I'll try and be brief. Um, I think one has to always step back and not be too reactive, to really try and isolate what the different issues are. And part of our problem as Jews, I think sometimes um, Jews are a little bit like somebody who's been sexually and physically abused as a child. Has never, and we were, our people have been deeply and profoundly abused. And then when we became an adult, without really deep therapy and great help, we react to every situation as if we're the same vulnerable child we were about to be physically and sexually abused. And, we, and that you also run the risk of becoming the, an abuser as well, right? We all know, for those of you who are in the field, that many abusers were abused as children if they didn't do really serious work. So I do think anti-Semitism in the world is a serious problem. The ADL has said there have 156% rise in anti-Semitic acts in America since Trump became president. 156%, not 156. You know what I'm saying, 156%. Most of them are in the form of graffiti. Most of the hate crimes against Muslims are violent, by the way, in America. There's more hate crimes against Jews in America right now, but they're mostly not violent, except for Pittsburgh. Um, they're mostly graffiti, but it's still 156%. Let's forget, not forget, Pittsburgh, 11 Jews were massacred in a synagogue the most serious massacre of Jews in America in our entire history of being here. Who did that act? And who was the, what group did that act? He was a white supremacist who was uh, inspired because the synagogue he attacked had the week before, as CBST did, participated in an immigration rights Shabbat organized by Hyas. Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And in his note he said he hated Jews because Jews were welcoming in immigrants. So it was so his vision of what he wanted to stop were activist Jews who actually took a position on immigration in this country. My concern about the Congresswoman, and I'll get to this in a second, as I said, there's a is that we're losing a little bit of perspective. She is a Somali immigrant. Why would she have any contact with Jews, right? Where would her Jewish experience be? I believe it's our, she is in the category of the educable and the reachable, and I think, and that's what's been happening this week. My congressman, Jerry Nadler, reached out to her and sat down with her yesterday for an extensive meeting and opened up lines of communication between her staff and his staff. We have to be careful about just blanketing everybody with the brush of anti-Semitism. I think she's not anybody who knows anything about our experience. Now, if I were to say to you, what's your position on the Somali government situation right now? Could you tell me anything? No. We, ha we expect as Jews that other people know as much about us as we do. They don't. That doesn't make, and they say stupid things, or they say ill-thought-of things, or they say things we experience anti-Semitic, but that wasn't their intention. We need to learn the difference between that and the guy who walked into that, church, that synagogue on, in Pittsburgh 
and uh, Charlottesville. Do you know what they chanted in Charlottesville in the march? Jews will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. That was chanted. Did you know that CNN did not report for three days that that was the chant? Because people couldn't even hear it. The only reason we know it is because it walked in front of a synagogue saying that. I know the rabbi of that synagogue. And the other part of the chant, do you know what the other part of the chant was? Besides Jews will not replace us? Blood and soil. Do you know what blood and soil means? It was a Nazi program called Blood and Soil, meaning the only people that deserved to stay in Germany when the Third Reich would, would achieve victory were people whose blood was Aryan and who were from the soil of Germany. It was one of their slogans of anti-Semitism that the Southern Poverty Law Center has identified as becoming one of the big chants of anti-Semitism in America. So this is a complicated answer because the other question is how do we get rid of the anti-Semitism that we experience in the world? I'm all for statements on Facebook and you know big statements condemning, but what's the next step? I believe both Muslim Congresswomen have very little reason to know much about Jews and I'm taking it on. I'm part of a group of people who have reached out to both of them, Rashida from uh, Detroit and Ilan Omar from Minnesota, and to create more lines of communication. I don't believe they are the long-term problem to us, and I think we need to be able to distinguish between the threats, and I do believe that anti-Semitism is spectacularly out of control in Europe. I do believe there is anti-Semitism on the left. I do not believe that criticism of Israel is necessarily anti-Semitism, but I do believe that some people use it as a weapon. Do you know what I mean? So there are multiple truths to hold at once, which is really complicated, because it's much easier just to have a really simple answer. And so I believe she's educable, and I, do, and I think every time we say, how come so-and-so is saying this or that? Think to yourself, how much do you know about their life experience? So Rashida from Detroit, her family is Palestinian. How much do you know about what a Palestinian's experience is besides screaming and yelling that they should understand what ours is? I'm not saying we'll agree at the end of the day, but I believe that by interrupting narratives of hate that we've been fed, we'll do more good ultimately long term. Will we be able to get rid of it all? No. And are there serious anti-Semites that just want us all dead? Yes. I want us to be able to distinguish, to not be so reactive that every, everything we smell is a trigger to an anti-Semite who's out to kill us. So that's, and it's not easy, it's exhausting. Yes. Okay. And so, but stay tuned, and Jerry Nadler, he's amazing. This is what I love about him. He reached out to her. He, he offered a statement which said it was an unfortunate blah, blah, and then he said, will you meet with me? She responded immediately. And they met yesterday morning. I haven't heard about the meeting itself. I just got an email from the staff saying they had a fantastic discussion. Isn't that what we want? And you know, I'm just going to say one other thing. When I became rabbi at CBST 27 years ago, as a lesbian rabbi, I went around all the time to do my lesbian rabbi, rabbi dog and pony show in synagogues all over the New York area. And if I said, I will not talk to any audience which is not already supportive of me, I wouldn't have anybody to talk to. But guess what? You have to talk to people who hate you sometimes. You have to find ways to say, I'm willing to sit down. I got a letter today from an Orthodox rabbi in Westchester, and he said he really wants to sit down with me, but he wants me to understand he really disagrees with me about some things. I said, fine, I disagree. Is there, I don't agree with, about everything with anybody in my family. I mean, why do we expect 100% alignment? Coalitions, working together is about finding things on which we agree. Believe me, I work with the Catholic Church on issues of economic justice. Guess what, they're a lot better than most Jewish organizations about issues of poverty and hunger. I don't like their positions on gay people. I don't like their positions on women. But if I'm gonna work on economic justice, guess what, most synagogues don't do bubkas. And the Catholic Church is really great on economic justice. The idea that we have to all agree on everything, but end, there are some limits. There are some anti-Semites I'm not going to work with. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so I totally know what you mean. So uh, let me just, so this issue of any, any criticism of Israel is seen as anti-Semitic is ludicrous, ludicrous, ridiculous. 
I'm very involved in Israel. I took two synagogue trips to Israel, which were both sold out this year, one for families with children, one for adults only. We spent several days on the West Bank. We totally dealt with all the real issues. Fantastic. There's fantastic stuff there. Most Israelis would say, I mean, it's like, you know, it's not uh, dissimilar to, is it unpatriotic to be critical of America? Give me a break. Would anybody in this room say you're not a good American if you're critical of Donald Trump? That is, it's, uh, it's so ludicrous that it's almost hard to say, right? I mean, I think we're patriotic by dissenting and by trying to build an America that we could be proud of. I object to people on the left who say, well, Israel was founded on the backs of Palestinians and is full of human rights abuses. Let me tell you something. America has done more human rights abuses in the X number hundreds of years of our existence than Israel could possibly do because we had a lot more power. We were founded on the genocide of Native Americans. Africans were enslaved here for hundreds of years and most of the economy of America. I mean, on, I don't need to tell you, on and on and on. But I still believe America should live up to there is an ideal that we need to aspire to, and I'm going to work with African Americans and Native Americans. They're not saying America should be obliterated because it has this painful history. They're saying we got to fix it, and that's what I'm saying. So that's why I'm, an, I'm a, I call myself a progressive Zionist because I believe in the commitment to Israel living up to the words of its Declaration of Independence. And I object to the forces, the fascist forces inside of Israel, which are destroying Israel on the inside. By the way, not just around Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Bibi, in the 20 years he's been prime minister, before Bibi was prime minister, FYI, and this I could also talk for hours about, the gap between rich and poor in Israel was the smallest in any industrial country in the West, even including the Scandinavian blah, blah, blah. In these 20 years, the gap between rich and poor in, America, in Israel is now second to America. Bibi Netanyahu has destroyed the social, uh, what do you call it? The network, net, net? The, the fa- not the fabric, the net. You know, the, you know, there used to be safety net, the social safety net, thank you. Totally destroyed it. He's privatized all of Israel's, what we have thought of the democratic socialist systems that supported people. There's now 12 oligarch families that control the economy of Israel. Guess, and guess which side Bibi is, how he fits into that. So just so Israel, honestly, if you really care about Israel, there are a lot of issues besides just this one. However, you brought up BDS. BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And the Palestinian civil society has called for that as a way to force Israel to change its policies about Palestinians, to withdraw from the West Bank. And uh, some people say it's only a tactic. I think it's a tactic that's used by a lot of anti-Semites, and that's what the problem is, is that I think there are some people who use it honestly, and a lot of the anti-Semites are not using it honestly. I'm against BDS, even though theory, I, I'm also against the laws that they're trying to pass in this country to outlaw BDS. I'm saying that as somebody who's against BDS. But I'll say this. The big difference and takeaway between South Africa, for instance, and Israel, and a huge topic, forgive me for, you know, uh, you know, I hope I I might be annoying some people, but I'm trying to jump into different things here, is that in South Africa, there was no progressive internal uh, 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 part of society. If you were against the government in South Africa, you were in jail, dead, or in exile. There was no lefty South African organizations. Now there are fantastic progressive organizations in Israel which are being starved to death by people who advocate boycott. And the right-wing American Jews, like Shelley Adelson, is pouring billions, and I'm not even exaggerating, and I, ex- I fetch and I exaggerate, but Shelley Adelson is pouring billions of dollars into Israel which supports the right-wing. So what we have is a progressive Israel which is being starved and a right-wing Israel which is being... Uh, funded by American Jewish right-wing money. So my argument is that if you care about progressive life in Israel, don't boycott, support the progressive life in Israel. They need us, and they need uh, that support and energy. Right, the Palestinians will say, you were upset with us when we were blowing up Israelis. You were upset with us when we were blowing up airplanes. This is a nonviolent tactic. What's wrong with it? And I think it's a strong argument. I would just say that the uh, embrace of it by many people is to obliterate Israel. 
And that's where it becomes, multiple, again, holding multiple truths. It's not a simple, it's not simple. But I'm not unsympathetic to the wanting to change Israel. I just believe if we don't change Israel with the help of the progressive forces, and there are, we're going to be in, you know, and it might be too late. I don't know. Yes, uh, so I'm glad you asked this question. Um, there were many things I didn't talk about the synagogue. And by the way, we have a book that was written. We're Jews, so we write books for the 40th anniversary of CBSD, which is a wonderful, and the author of this book, you might want to bring out sometimes a speaker. She's really, she's a rabbi in New York, and she wrote, and kind of a real study in all the changes in Jewish life and LGBTQ life, very interesting, uh, who is a rabbi at CBSC. Ayelet Cohen. Uh, she's a straight rabbi who was a rabbi at CBSC for 10 years with me. It's called Congregation Beit Simchat Torah, Changing Lives, Making History, The First 40 Years. Um, it's a wonderful book, and um, I actually brought it as a gift for your organization to give to you, and I don't know, figure out how to share it, I don't know. Um, so um, CBSC has been very engaged in transgender issues, and we are having actually a convening, I have to check the date, March 28th, I think, one of the first ever Jews, uh, trans, uh, uh, trans Jews are here convening which we're bringing trans Jews from around the country to the synagogue for a Shabbaton, part of it with the general community and part of it with targeted uh, special, uh, special sessions for a, uh, basically a three-day convening with a Friday night service, then Shabbat day stuff, and then Sunday with performers. Um, I could certainly send information about it. Uh, last year, I want to tell you a story. Uh, we've been very involved in Genda. In fact, one of my assistant rabbis was in Albany for the day the Genda bill was signed. I sent her there and she gave the invocation for the state senate because the synagogue has been so involved in the, in the work on Genda, which is long time coming, a long time coming. And um, we've, we had the first openly trans rabbinical student at CBST. And I'm bringing him, he's now, he's been a rabbi in San Francisco for many years. He's coming in to help lead the service that Friday night of this convening. And we have a, a committee in the synagogue that works on trans issues. And every Pride Month, we do some special programming around. And all during the year, our Sidur has trans readings in it. It's totally part of the community. Always more we could be doing, but it's a real, and this past Friday, uh, Saturday night, we had a trans Abdullah service, um, ending Shabbat, going into the week. So last December, uh, no, last January, uh, one of the two times I got arrested this past year, we had a DACA, a Jewish demonstration about the whole DACA um, Dreamers Act, and 88 of us were arrested in the Russell Senate building uh, in DC, and um, about 65 of us were rabbis. It was the first time it's ever a big Jewish civil disobedience. It was very moving, and when we were in the police wagon being waiting to be taken to the police station to be processed with our handcuffs on, and there were 10 rabbis in the police wagon. I said, listen, we're going to be here a long time. Maybe somebody has something they could teach while we're here. Let, <laughs> let's, let's, you know, let's introduce ourselves. Let's learn, you know, who has something they want to teach? And sitting across from me was this guy with a big black hat, big black beard, who I would look at normally and think, this is an ultra-Orthodox rabbi who hates gay people. And okay, he's good on... He's good on immigration stuff, but, eh, you know, I was a little nervous. And he said, oh, I have something to teach. And he, you know, I've been doing this work about LGBT Jewish stuff for a long time, and there's pretty rare for me to hear somebody say something new. You know, if you're in your own field, you know, you, they, you know, eh, and I'm usually a little ho-hum, oh, another rabbi who's discovered something. But he gave a lesson, a shiur, that I'd never thought of before. It was revelation to me. So we had four hours together while we were being processed, and I got to know this guy. He was an ultra-Orthodox rabbi whose son transitioned a few years before, and he was transformed, and he became an LGBTQ, especially trans, but not only trans, ally and advocate, and he was fired from his Orthodox synagogue when he started talking this way, you can imagine. And he was now working in a deli, slicing, making sandwiches, because he couldn't get a job in the Orthodox world because of his positions on trans and LGBT equality. So I said, I got to find a way to hire you. You know, this is amazing. And I found a little money, not enough, and it's running out now. So if anybody here is 
loaded and wants to support a great project. We're looking for it. And I said to him, will you come to CBST and be a scholar in residence? You know, so you don't have to work on Shabbat. You know, I want you to read and write and speak. And now we have on staff of the LGBT synagogue, a Haredi ultra-Orthodox rabbi. And his whole, and, because, and he is, he uh, speaks now all over. You could have him here too. He'd love to come out here. And it's amazing is the amount of counseling he's doing. The Orthodox world, because he's been trashed in every Orthodox paper around the world for working at CBST, every person knows he's there. So we, he is getting emails. He gets six to 10 emails a day from Orthodox families around the world. Sometimes it's the trans person themselves. Sometimes it's the kid, the parent, the mother, the, you know, say they need to talk to an Orthodox rabbi. How can this be okay for Judaism? And I can't be the rabbi they're gonna talk to. It's not gonna be as meaningful. So now we've got this ally and he's changing the Orthodox world. And he's now doing all the trans programming at CBST as the, an ally. And uh, it's very, very, very moving. So it's a lot of different stuff happening. Uh, and so the ripple effects, yes, it's where it starts. Let's face it, it's where it starts. Who cares about anti-Semitism more than Jews? Nobody. You know, in the AIDS crisis, who cared about AIDS except gay people? Nobody. So that's what I meant before. You start where you are. And it's okay to be passionate about it. But it doesn't end there. I mean, the Jewish world, the larger world, is transformed about gay stuff, right? It does, it's no longer just people who are gay themselves who care about gay stuff. I don't think that's true anymore. But it is about relationships, and that's what's so important. So now this guy who is personally affected, he's publishing and writing and teaching. Last weekend, he was at an Orthodox synagogue somewhere in upstate New York, as a scholar in residence, teaching that crowd, and they don't necessarily have personal connections, but all of a sudden, they now have a connection to him, and he can teach them Torah in a way that's new. I agree with you, it's frustrating, it's the way it is, but that's where it starts, but it does not end. And we each start where we are, and move the circles outside. But I don't think we should be frustrated about it, I think we should just say, how can I, in the relationships I have, change people in the way they are? And I have to believe, as somebody, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm turning 60 this summer, so in my lifetime, and some of you are older than I am, in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of good happen, right? I mean, people pick up the poop after their dogs. Think about what it used to be like. <laughs> Nobody would think about it's okay not to pick up the poop in your towns, right? That's an amazing, radical change. You know, it's just the... Who smokes anymore? Maybe some people here do, but mostly, you know, nobody smokes in a restaurant anymore. What an amazing change. You can even go into a bar, nobody smokes, at least, is that true on the island? Yeah. So you start where you are. Appreciate the changes that have happened. The changes in my own lifetime, and yeah, things go backwards, they do. Don't despair, okay? <laughs> and if you start despairing, just remember, Sharon Kleinbaum told me I'm not allowed to despair. Maybe that'll work for you. Small things, matter. I'm going to end with one last story. Pete Seeger was a big hero of mine. I'm sure a lot of you loved Pete Seeger. There was an amazing story in the New York Times about him that was then quoted in his obituary when he died. But the story was, I don't know, he lived to be like 99 or something, or quite he, close. He said, you know, at a certain point in his life, he couldn't go to demonstrations anymore. He lost it, and he couldn't sing much anymore. Even for many years, he really was just speaking the words and playing the banjo. But then he came to a point where he couldn't even go on stage anymore, and he couldn't go to demonstrations anymore. He said, but you know what? Wherever I am, I can pick up the litter. And so that's what I do. Wherever I go, I look to see, is there litter on the ground I can pick up? And somebody else is going to have to go to the demonstrations. Somebody else is going to have to go on the picket lines, because I can't do that anymore. But I can still pick up the litter. So we each have to figure out what we can do. And sometimes it's picking up the litter. And you do it until you can't do whatever it is it is. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.